602 for the annual reorganization meeting of the White River Unified District Board. And um, we're gonna, I think what I'm gonna adjust to the agenda is I'm gonna put 5.1, elect a chair point in, a person to number two, and then we'll operate from there. Is there a motion to accept that adjustment to the agenda? So moved. Second. Second. Oh, we just I'll lost Andrew. That. Okay. Andrew's Andrew back. He's back. I'll second. All those that. in favor say aye. 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 All right. I will take nominations for chairperson of the White River Unified District Board. Any nominations? Uh, I'll nominate Andrew Jones. I'll second that. Any additional nominations? Discussion? Andrew, are you good with this? Yep, I'm um, okay with it. Good. I thought you might have been. I'll do a quick roll call vote. Uh, Lisa? Aye. Shannon? Aye. Chris? Aye. And Andrew? Aye. It's good with it. <laughs> all right, Andrew, it's all yours. Uh, so we are on actually now, um, if there's any additional adjustments to the agenda, and I think there's going to be. So I wanted to let you navigate that though. Okay. So, so uh, Andrew, what we were saying was, is that we think we're going to actually lose our quorum tonight. And so it made sense to adjust all the business up that needed action. Um, and I think Lisa, we have you for 30 minutes, right? So that would mean uh, moving items uh, 9.5, 9.6, 10.1 and 10.2 up. Uh, maybe after the reorg or actually after the consent agenda and then carrying on after that because the rest is all discussion. Okay. Does that sound good to everybody? All right, we'll do that. So 9.5, 9.6, 10.1, and 10.2 will move up to, I guess, are we doing that? I guess after the consent agenda, since that shouldn't take very long. Okay, so that'll become item seven. All right, so let's see if we can get through the uh, reorg quickly so we can get to that. So we're on to 5.2, elect a chairperson. I'm uh, vice chair, not, not the chair, vice chairperson. Do we have any nominations for vice chairperson? I'll nominate Shannon Morrill Cornelius. I'll second it. Okay. Any other nominations? Okay. Any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? Okay. Dan Thanks, we'll Lisa. Right. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so clerk, we'll elect a clerk. Um, do we have any nominations for clerk? Do we need to select that right now? I think Lisa's been happy doing it, but I don't know. All right, do you want to make a motion to table it until she's here, and then we can take it up when she gets here? Is that okay? <laughs> I think that's fine. I agree. I don't want to take it away from her if she wants it, but if she doesn't want to do it anymore, it is a lot of work, so... Yeah, it is a lot of work. I and would make a I would make a motion to table that until she's okay. able to speak. Okay, I'll second that. Yeah, okay. we'll table that until she's here. Okay, um, three members for the WRVSU full board. Do we have volunteers for this? I'll be one. Need two others. Lisa, are you looking to step off? 
Yeah, I'll so, I'll be one as long as we do what we've always done and make everybody else an alternate so that if I can't make it, um, I'll communicate. Okay, great. All right, so me, Lisa, and... I can do that. Okay, Shannon. And then everybody else will be alternates. Is that okay with everybody? Sounds good. Um, is this something we need to make a motion for, or can we just? Okay. No, you're appointing, so you don't actually need to. All right. Um... So, Andrew, did you appoint um, Andrew, Lisa Floyd, Shannon as three members to the White River Valley Supervisory Union full board with Lisa M and Chris as alternates? Yes. That's what you said. Okay. And we'll appoint an unknown and the... Royalton member as yeah. alternate number three. <laughs> okay. And then, um, um, Andrew, not to put words in your mouth, but um, in appointing three members to the White River, oh, I'm sorry, in appointing one member and one alternate to the executive board, are you appointing two people? Um, well, we haven't done it yet. So that's next. Okay. Um, my guidance is you appoint someone. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I'll be the executive board member i assume is the chair um and shannon as vice chair do you want to be the alternate i'm happy to do that yes okay is that what you meant tammy <laughs> okay there we go um okay a recording secretary tammy are you okay being recording secretary going forward Unless Lisa McCrory objects, so. I'm sure she won't. Okay. We'll appoint Tammy Benoit as the recording secretary. Um, so signing AP and payroll, that's what uh, Rodney used to do. Uh, do we have anybody who would like to step up to fill his shoes? I'm actually working full time from home now, so I, I'm happy to do that. Unless Chris, you looked like you were going to jump in there. So if you yeah. absolutely want to do it, and we can also appoint both of you, and either yeah. of you can do it depending on how it works. Okay. And it's, okay. yeah. We should have a uh, primary I'm... and a secondary, Andrew. Okay, we'll appoint Shannon as the primary and Chris as the secondary. Is that all right? Either that or the other way around. I mean, I've I did this last week's, uh, and it's worked okay. pretty smoothly because they. They just email it to me and I can electronically sign it and just email it back. That's uh, okay. fine. Chris, with why don't you be primary? Shannon will be secondary. I don't want to, don't want to shirk all the responsibilities. <laughs> Wait until we get to yeah. the technical center. For you. <laughs> Andrew, can I ask a clarification question? Yeah. Um, to the executive board. So Andrew and Shannon, is there an alternate? I'm, I, I'm the primary and Shannon's the secondary. To the okay, extent. and the alternate. Um, the alternate, right. Oh, okay, got it. Thank you. All right. Um, so we have a member and an alternate for signing AP and payroll. Um, negotiation board. Um, that's another one Lisey's done in the past. So um, do you think we can? preliminarily appoint Lisa and then do we have a second person who's interested? I've done that in the past and okay. um, enjoyed it so I'm happy to do it again. Okay so we'll appoint Lisa McCrory and Shannon Moral Cornelius as members of the negotiation board. We have a meeting Thursday night Shannon just so you know to kick off planning for support staff so Thursday at six. And uh, okay, we're on to our TCC representative. We have a volunteer for this. <laughs> I I can do it. Uh, I I didn't do it this last year, although I don't know. I think Rodney and and Bob were I think covering it. Uh, but then I know like Linda Lubold from our TCC started sending them to me again. Uh, and I would just forward it on to to Rodney and and to Bob. So, um, but yeah, I can do it. Uh, I think uh, yeah, if they're doing remote meetings, that's that's okay. pretty easy for me to do. All right. 
Uh, Jamie, Annie. can you shoot me the invite for that meeting at some point? Thanks. Um, the truant officer, this has always been, um, uh, I'm blanking. Either. It's always been the principals, actually. Oh, the principals. Okay. Yeah. So I'll appoint the three principals as truant officers. We didn't appoint Loretta Stalnecker, the chief in Royalton last year. In the end, we work with them anyway, so it's okay. I'm okay if Reed and Andrew want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, Owen, you take it on. Okay. Um, newspaper, radio station for official notices. Um, newspaper is the Herald. Um, do we appoint Valley News as well? I probably should have looked up all this stuff. We have, we have in the past appointed Valley News. Okay. So the Herald and Valley News are our newspapers um, and the radio station. What did we do in the past? Did we pull up the minutes for that last meeting last year? I think we've done WCVR and then BPR. WCVR. Yeah. Okay, CBR and then what was the other one? Um, WDV is the king, yes. Um, I don't know if we've appointed them though. Um, VPR, I thought we did because isn't this for like school cancellations and stuff like that? Yeah, I think so. Okay, we'll go with those two for. Can you restate that, Andrew? I'm sorry. <laughs> what was the first one again? Um, newspaper. W oh. uh, the newspapers, the Randolph Herald and Valley News. And the radio stations were, um, Lisa, would you mind repeating that too? WCVR, so the Randolph radio station, and then BPR. Um, and prior notes, I'm seeing a reference to Vermont broadcasters. So when we submit like snow days, we submit it to the greater Vermont broadcasters and who wants to pick that up, picks it up from a general list. Great, okay, that makes good sense. Okay. Okay. Then let's do that. I will not be listing WCVR or VPR. I'm do listing um, Greater Vermont nice. Broadcasters. Great. Great. Um, so the date, time, and location of regular school board meetings will be the third Tuesday of the month at 6 o'clock p.m. Um, location will be virtual until we get back to in-person meetings when they will alternate between the Royalton library and the Bethel library, school library, not town library. Um, okay, posting places. Um, this is at the front office of both schools and the post office in both towns. Is that right? Is that what we've done in the past? Yeah, the schools, the town offices, and the post offices, I think. Right. Okay. Tools, schools, post offices, and town offices are posting places. Um, and, and is there any other that we have? I think that might be uh, a finance committee. Okay, finance committee. Um, I'm happy to continue to do that. Do we have a second person who would like to be on the finance committee? Bob had been, but he's no longer with us. Can we wait until we have an, a new member and see if they're interested? Sure. Why don't we put this into future agenda item? Um, and, and then facilities. I would suggest Lisa McCrory and I continue with that. Uh, we've, you know, the committee we've met three times now, I think four times. So I think we've got some, I guess we're meeting a week from today. This is our next scheduled meeting. Okay. And I got one more, sorry. Policy. 
I, I can stick with policy if, I'm, if everyone's okay with that. That'd be great. I kind of like that kind of reading and stuff. <laughs> Okay. So I think that completes our reorganization, at least until we do the clerk when Lisa arrives. Lisa M. So we'll move to the consent agenda. We have the minutes from Tuesday, February 16th, the regular, and then Tuesday, February 16th, the special, and the minutes of Monday, March 1st, special. Do I have a moment, motion to approve those minutes? <laughs> I'll make a motion to approve those minutes. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. The minutes in those three meetings are approved. Okay, so we'll move on to um, the action items. Um, the Code of Ethics is the first one, formerly 9-5 now. So um, I've added this to all the reorg agendas. Um, the Stratford board was very interested in formally adopting the model VSPA code of ethics. I know it's something that I've talked to uh, Kathy Galuzzo about in regards to the SU board looking at. Um, and so I'm just including it as an agenda item and in, the, in packets for folks to consider. Um, of whether or not that's something that they would be interested in formally adopting as a district board. Um, one of the, my goals as superintendent in regards to my evaluation is to increase formally board um, training and um, having a working binder around board training and procedure as we move forward for the upcoming school year. And so certainly this is one of the things that will align to part of that process. Um, as we as we look at board development. And so it's something that I want you to discuss and then consider whether or not you'd be willing to take action on it. Okay, um, Lisa, your hand is raised. Yeah, um, we've looked at this in the past and I really like it. Um, and I am in favor of taking action on it, I think it's really helpful to have all of that clearly articulated and just something that we can we can all agree on. Did we sign this last year or I, I remember signing this at one of these years. I can't remember. I remember I, we may have just talked about it this last year, but uh, uh, but I remember signing it at least once in the past and and I'm yeah supportive of it uh, as well. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree. I'm happy to have it be official um, that this is what we'd like to, how we'd like to proceed. So on that vein, do we make a motion to uh, adopt this co code of ethics and have prospective board members sign it? I'll make a motion that we um, accept it or that we, we all agree to it and we sign it. A second that. Okay, so the motion is that we will all sign the SBA Code of Ethics. Um, okay, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, any opposed? Motion passes. Um, okay, so I guess, uh, so uh, does everybody have it in digital form? You want to print it out and we can send it yeah, to you? Yeah, I'll give it to you without the draft. I think the one I sent you today doesn't have draft that I emailed the board. Yeah, um, looks like you just want to print that out and sign it, or if you can digitally sign and just get it back to us, then we'll keep it in a folder. Okay. Um, so I, I would assume what we just did applies just for this year? Is this something that we want to kind of adopt as a policy that 
new board members. Yeah, it's something that I think we need to think about, Andrew, whether it just becomes policy. That right. part of this is just part of how we do business. It's not yet. So I thought before we move to the policy, maybe it'd be a good thing to just take action in each board and have a conversation around it. And then my sure. hope was to move that into some type of policy statement. Okay, good. All right. Um, so the next would be uh, the presentation on the next steps to address Bethel heating. Who's doing this? I'm sorry, I meant 9.4, Andrew, uh, the okay. audit. That's the other action item. I'm sorry okay. if I said 9.6. Uh, I may have misheard or misremembered. Okay, audit. So I assume this is Tara who will be taking the reins now. You all received uh, the copies of the audits that we've received to date. We do have one change pending and that's just they didn't have the general fund balances matching on two of the pages. So that's the only change that's coming. So I didn't receive any specific questions from any of you. So if you're ready to accept, that would be great. So you want us to accept it tonight prior to receiving whatever the final copy is? The numbers didn't change, Andrew. It's still the 399,151 that it was. It just doesn't show up on the both pages the same. So whatever you're comfortable with. Okay. Maybe we can make a motion to accept the audit with the correction of the total on page, whatever it is. Let me turn that page. Ray, what page was it? Do you remember? Um, page 18 will need to be updated to match page 16. I'll make a motion that we accept the 1920 audit, the fiscal year 1920 audit, pending the correction of page 18 so that it matches page 16. And right. I probably can't say that again. <laughs> I'll second it. Okay, we have a motion on the table. Uh, is there any discussion? What were the years referenced in the words that Lisa said, Tara? 1920. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. I think, it, I think it'd just be FY20, right? Yep. Okay. Either one. You can do fiscal year 1920 or just FY20. Either one. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So is there any discussion on the audit? Okay. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. The audit is approved pending the corrections. Thank you very much. I'm very glad to be almost done with audits to have a few <laughs> months off before the next one starts. <laughs> Okay. Um, okay, so those were the two action items. Was there anything else that you wanted to do before we lose our quorum, Jamie? No, I think that's it. I think we can get back back to seven okay. and then go on to eight. All right. So is there any board comment at this time? I, have, I don't have the agenda up in front of me right now, but I'm assuming at some point, do we have an item to talk about filling the other board seat? <laughs> and then, yeah, I was gonna, and I, I actually have news about that. Uh, someone's reached out uh, in regards to um, have, being interested in it. So that I was gonna take up under the results of the, of the annual budget meeting and vote. 
Okay. Any other board comment at this time? Okay. Let's oh, you could elect Lisa now. If, if she, Hi, uh... everybody. <laughs> hey, Lisa. Okay, so we didn't, um, we have reorganized, um, going to be the board chair. And um, let's see, the other thing that applies to you is are you okay with being on the negotiations committee? Uh, yes, unless somebody else wants. I know that Shannon. Well, did Shannon's it. going to be too. Um, uh we have two members appointed to the negotiations committee, Shannon and you, if that's yeah. okay with you. Okay, and we'd um, tabled the clerk um, election until you were here so that you could say whether you want to be the clerk or not. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to continue, but I've been doing it for, what will this be, four years? Oh, I mean, no, three. If somebody else wants to take that job, I'm... It doesn't bother me, but if you want me to continue, I'm happy to do it. Is there anybody dying to be clerk? Hearing none. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so do we have a nomination for clerk then? I nominate Lisa McCurry for clerk. I second. <laughs> okay. Um, any discussion? All in favor? Say aye. 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 Okay. Lisa McCrory is our clerk. Yay. Okay. So, um, yeah, I think that was basically everything. We've, um, we've accepted the audit and we're going to be signing the ethics code that um, Jamie sent out. So that should catch you up. <laughs> And we're, um, if you have any board comment, that's what we were just finishing up. Yeah, any board comment, Lisa? I, okay. Yeah, I'm all set with that. We'll move on to the superintendent's report. Uh, yeah, Lisa, you're still on the facilities committee as well. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you have my report in hand, a few things to add on to the report. Just um, one, we are uh, engaging deeply now in data analysis around our federal grant um, as far as need at the SU for best how to best leverage our consolidated federal grant. But that is gonna tie directly to how we use our recovery funds. Um, and so those are known as ESSER two and they're focused on student wellness and social emotional health, um, student engagement in truancy and academic regression. Um, and so from Rudd on the SUY task force is gonna be Mindy Beth Pike um, and also our high school math teacher. And this is embarrassing read that I'm blanking. Lisa Berg, look at that on it, Lisa Berg. Um, and so we got about a 10 member team um, uh, that's going to have representatives from every district um, in all different areas um, to dig into that work. I'm also pleased to let you know that Anda, sorry, Anda um, Adams is also joining us for that work as she starts to kick off some preliminary work at the SU level, getting to know us, uh, get, getting to know us better before coming on officially July 1. And um, that's exciting work. Um, the ESSER two funds total over a million dollars that we can use to best support recovery efforts across the SU. Um, and then we do expect additional funds in ESSER three. Uh, Tara and I are meeting um, tomorrow to finalize the budget process for ESSER one. Those are funds that can be utilized uh, throughout this winter but then carry over to the spring. Um, and ESSER two takes effect on jo June 1st and goes through two solid school years uh, to the spring of 2023. And so what we're looking at is how do we best leverage those funds around PD, um, additional social emotional support. So you've heard me talk about the idea of um, school-based clinicians 
um, and partnering with Clara Martin to help provide us with some therapeutic interventions within the school setting. Um, and so those are all the types of things that we're looking at. And I'll expand on those concepts some more at the SU meeting next week. The other thing that's been going on, of course, is the rollout of vaccination um, for our faculty and staff. We were originally hoping that um, we would have vaccine available through some type of partnership with the Health Hub, um, or at least Gifford. Uh, that has not been leveraged that way. And so faculty and staff have been navigating um, at different drop-in clinics across the state. Um, I do know that Gifford got about 33 doses yesterday for faculty and staff. Um, I'm not certain how many of our folks took advantage of that particular site because it was also designated for Randolph and 33 does not go far when we have close to 400 um, staff across the SU. And so um, I do know that some of our smaller schools are almost completely vaccinated, which is exciting. And I know that folks have been continuing to access at Rudd. The, um, finally, I wanted to just bring to your attention one of the things that I've been um, hyper-focused on behind the scenes is a preventative maintenance plan, and your facilities committee heard an idea that we had in regards to bringing in a consultant, and they're, he's going to come in tonight, Mike Davey. He presented already at the First Branch Unified District around how to best leverage what we know are incoming federal money um, to refurbish around buildings around HVAC systems, but also on efficiency. Um, and so what I'm gonna be asking the board to consider tonight is allowing us to take action on putting out an RFP that would allow different um, consulting agencies to come do audits on our system free of charge and present us with a plan of how we may be able to leverage the efficiencies that we are able to secure through upgrading our systems to not have added tax burden on the overall expenditure budget. And Mike does a much better job of articulating how that works. And he'll have a presentation for you tonight where you can ask questions about that. Uh, the action tonight would not to be to engage in any partnership. It would just allow us to start to seek um, folks out that might be interested in pursuing this work. Um, I'm very interested in us looking at um, re, we, the heating system in Bethel is going to need attention here very soon. We know that we're not going to be able to leverage this work this summer, but I, I think we have to have a plan of attack for the following summer. And I also know that fiscal times are tight and will remain tight. Um, and so uh, looking at how could we finance this um, without adding additional tax burden. And they, uh, they've worked with several different school systems to do this type of work. Um, without adding additional costs because the efficiencies guarantee that they guarantee the efficiencies and those efficiencies then um, are what pays for the, the short term note to do the work. And so they'll explain that this evening. And then I'll take any other questions folks have. Does anybody have anything for Jamie? Sounds like not. So thank you, Jamie. Oh. Move on to the uh, principals. Good evening. Welcome, new board member. <clears throat> and we know you well. We, um, our report, one of the first things we point out is how happy and we are of the support of the community as you are, I'm sure. And we continue to be safe in everything we do when it comes to COVID. And um, Reed, you wanna talk about the musical that's coming up and then we'll go down through our goals? Sure. We uh, just got guidance uh, in the last two weeks that we can start to sing and dance. So uh, very excited to, to ramp that up. Uh, we're now looking for a vocal coach and uh, a companyist, uh, but uh, we picked the show, the contract's been signed. 
and hopefully uh, within the week we'll have kids uh, auditioning and getting ready for the show. Yeah, and we um, under goal one, we continue to um, figure out how or try to figure out how to way to create teams that support kids in intervention, pre-K through 12. And, One of the ways we can... Go ahead, Andrew. I just, I think, I think the thing I would want to highlight in that section is we just are wrapping up some pretty big assessments of how oh, PAS is working. We've inventoried students, families, um, staff, uh, and, you know, it's, it feels, feels kind of yucky asking some of the questions we have to ask about involvement in school because it's hard to be involved in school during a pandemic but i think we got some good information and i know that our teams are really excited to take that information and work on our action plan moving forward to help improve some of those areas and we got some good feedback so i think that's the highlight of that section that i'd like to point out and we are planning for our summer professional development looking at the um, Summer Best Institute and at how we can further build our um, support systems. And Reed, do you want to mention the recovery plan that you had in there? Uh, yeah, that's just kind of a follow-up on what Jamie mentioned in his report, that the, the state's looking for us to, to be working on that. Uh, clearly, there'll be the supervisory union task force piece, but at each of our our sites will need to have site specific plans for, for how to work with kids at, at the different grade levels to help them uh, recover from any any uh, deficits that arose because of the pandemic. Okay. Learning loss. Learning loss. And we, and we, um, <clears throat> we interviewed for the flexible pathways coordinator position. You wanna talk about that, Reed? Uh, I, actually, we, we interviewed for the um, for two special ed positions and are doing background checks on them right now. One's a high school uh, special ed case manager that will be heavily involved with students who will be in the alternative program next year. And the other is um, almost, you can almost look as an assistant special ed coordinator for the supervisory union uh, who will be overseeing the alternative programs, AKA Wildcat Institute, formerly known as uh, the restorative classroom uh, or restorative program, uh, that will also be the umbrella for the high school alternative program. Uh, so we've got two candidates that were quite qualified, uh, lucky to have the candidates as qualified as they are, and hopefully we'll, uh, we'll have them signed by the end of the week. Uh, Next week, we turn our attention to the Flexible Pathways Coordinator. Uh, again, the, the initial look at applications we have is, is very strong. Uh, we think we'll find someone good for that position, uh, but that'll, we'll report on that next month. Yeah, and those two candidates, uh, of course, will be um, SU level staff. Um, so they'll come in front of the SU board on Monday evening. And Don can introduce those folks to folks. Okay, do we have any questions for the principals? I have a question. Um, I have been hearing not just from my kids, but from a number of, of children and families, um, a lot of grumbling about the um, the food and meal plan and and quality of lunches this year um like i said before i can't walk into the school and and sit down with the kids like i used to but um my concern is that there are kids more kids than ever that aren't getting a lot of of great nutrition at home and my kids are saying you know not only can we not go back for seconds anymore which is understandable with covid but the portions are very small and they're they're always hungry and they're starving all day. Any comments on that or things that are being done to try and change that? And I will say the kids I know about are on the Bethel campus, so I don't know. 
but it should be similar. Yeah, I think it's it's interesting. It's the first time hearing about it, you know, is at this level. Uh, it's too bad. I would hope that people would reach out to us directly at school. I do know that it there's a lot of requirements given the pandemic about how things can be delivered and prepackaged. And it isn't like being in the cafeteria where they can just call up for seconds. You know, they deliver to the classrooms and um, everything's prepackaged. It's just, you know, in a container. Um, but, you know, I think if people are feeling that way, they should just let us know. We still are doing the fresh fruit and veggie every day and sending in, in, in uh, the lunches. And I think if we know anybody's hungry, we're always going to help. I, we still do have bowls of apples in the cafeteria and, and want to help feed kids. No one wants anyone to be hungry. So, yeah. Just so I can clarify, Andrew, because I think folks might misinterpret this. You're still making fresh food. You're just packaging it and delivering it. Not yeah, it, it looks like it's coming in like a to-go box. <laughs> uh, and it goes into, um, well, in some places, like into a warmer, depending on what the food is. And then gets delivered down the hallway where the teachers pick it up in the hallway. It's, I would it's, also reinforce the chain of command piece, but that it's also on the agenda tonight, isn't it, Jamie, to talk generally about yeah. food service and the SU level. And Shannon, just so you know, we, we know that the, um, if you will, the presentation and quality may have dipped, but we know once we're back with feet on the ground, it's gonna go right back up. It's a little complicated, as you might imagine, to feed, you know, 600 people plus or minus each day with with the COVID restrictions. But we're doing a pretty good job. I'm pretty proud of what they've done. Some of it I see and I'm like, ah, OK, that's different. But we and if anybody's hungry, the point Andrew made, we want to know. Well, I think you might have some middle schoolers coming to see you because I told them you're the person they need to come see. So perfect. <laughs> so Actually, Owen. Yeah, they should go to their teacher and then to me, but I'll help them. I'll definitely help them. And I would just follow up by saying that I, I think I can't give Misha kudos enough as a brand new food service person. And she does want feedback and she does she does shift with the feedback um, as yeah. much as she can. So I think she's open to it. Um, and maybe we should create a feedback loop for her. But thank you. I think it's a great way for us to engage student voice further too. Absolutely. So that's <clears throat> we're going to present our academic data at a different part in the agenda, unless the chair tells us to do it now. No, I think we can wait for the agenda item for that. Thank you. That's our report. Right. Um, one thing I was curious about is. Um, with the new trimester coming and the different, you know, some people work to non people. Um, like, what, how many, like, does it seem like a lot of people are, we don't have a virtual academy update. Uh, do we have a, most people shifting from virtual to non Like, just an update on how the virtual academy is going to be after that. I think that was super garbled, but I think right. that. I think the question was how many kids are coming back from virtual? Sort of. Are All we right. going to need to make any staffing adjustments or anything based on numbers? Okay. No, no and you know, I will formally announce that VLA will be discontinued, of course, at the end of the school year and that everyone will come back in person next fall. Um, we will keep it in place for the remainder of the year. Um, but the expectation from the AOE is that we will be back next fall. Um, and right now I'm working with uh, Owen and Reed around how do we handle the fact that we're still only in four days a week at middle and high school because, again, the expectation as we move forward is that we're getting students back five days a week. Um, and we know we have the capacity because we do it four days already, so we're thinking about when does the right timing work for that. Okay. Um, so if there's nothing else for the principals, we'll move on to the business manager.
You all have my report, so I'll take any questions that you have on any of the information I provided. Otherwise, I'll have Ray project the revenue and expenditure summary, and we can quickly go over the changes to that. Ray, can you put the revenue? Oh, there we go. Beautiful. Thank you. So the first page is the expenditures, and the only update I've made there is the COVID cost. Increase that to the 203,171 from the 172,290. So if you can scroll down a little bit, Ray. So current surplus projection is 54,475 on the expenditure side of the budget. And if you can move to the second page, Ray. And then the only change that I've made on the, oh, sorry, I skipped one. Ray, can you go back to the expenditure? I added in $8,500 of savings on the equipment. And as we get closer to the end of the fiscal year, I may be adding some additional items there too. So on the revenue side, the only change was the increase in the COVID reimbursement. And so current projected surplus is 173,290. And I've updated uh, the FY20 per the audit for the current deficit of that 399,151 that I discussed earlier with you. And those are the only changes so far. Any questions on that? We're that's shooting to try to get it over 200. That's the goal. That's great. Yep. Oh, um, I don't think I've seen the regular expenditures and revenue reports recently. Um, I'm not sending them anymore unless you specifically request them. Because we we're doing do this them, instead. Could we still do them quarterly? Just to be good to see them to make sure that, you know, yep. if we want to look into it, you know that they match what we're seeing here. Okay. All right, Good thanks there. Good tightening principles. What'd you say? Good belt tightening. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the policy committee. Um, I guess that yeah, would have been so I can I can discuss this uh, since Lisa had to jump off. So we are currently in draft two of an anti-racism policy. Um, it's been going in front of each district um, to gather feedback from boards. Um, and there's been some community groups that have been really actively engaged in this work. And so they've been offering, excuse me, feedback through their board. Um, I'm collecting all the feedback. And then we are going to work on an additional draft next week with the SU Policy Committee. They're going to meet next Thursday, the 25th, um, for draft three. I just interviewed with the Herald this evening. Um, my, I suspect we're going to be on a draft four before we're ready for adoption. Um, I'm excited that there's been more conversation around this in general. Um, I know that I can tell you the most um, the area that we've received the most feedback on has been around the definition of racism. Um, and so there's been some specific feedback around that and some good suggestions by the Stratford board around how we may be able to, to define that to better meet our needs around policy. Um, and so I, if you don't have feedback to offer now, please feel free to mark this up and send it to me. I'm collecting it in a Google Drive folder that will then be shared with the policy committee and used to inform the next draft. And Owen, you've been engaged in this work too. I don't know if you have anything else to add specific to the policy. I know we have a bunch of PD happening right now, which I'm really proud of that I talked about with the Herald um, this evening. Yeah, I would say, I'm gonna tell you, this is my 21st year as a school principal and 31st as an educator. And it's one of the most detailed and thoughtful policies I've seen. 
I'm really proud of the work that's being done also. We have um, 40 faculty members throughout the SU taking, working in a professional learning uh, group to address white supremacy and anti-racism. And that's ongoing in the evenings and after school. And we are continue to look at how we're gonna do this work. And we're looking at our libraries and what's in our libraries and what's not. At the White River Valley Middle School, we are reading a book, a group book throughout the middle school called Ghost Boys, which is about a, um, a black boy who's killed by a police officer. Jamie, you will have your, um, you're gonna have your book report due soon. And um, if you want a copy of that, let us know. It's a, it's a young adult book and it's, uh, it hasn't been released to the middle school students yet, so they don't know, Shannon. But we're building a, a plan to roll that out. So we're pretty excited about it. And more to more to more to come. If you know, if you have any ideas, reach out to me and I'm I'm glad to move them forward. I'll just read his copy before he takes it. <laughs> After he goes to sleep. Oh, before he wakes up in the morning, because he is your typical middle school student. You'll be able to read it in the afternoon. So yeah, if you have specific feedback, just get it to me um, and we'll use it to inform our work as we move forward. Okay, thanks guys. All right, I guess we're on to the academic data reports. Back to the principles. Attached to the principal report at the bottom are two links. One for winter achievement data and that's academic achievement data report. The other one is for the social emotional learning data, and that will be the next report you get, but you got an early copy. So, uh, Andrew, weren't we going to go through this reading, Andrew, by grade level? And you were going to go first, Andrew, I think. That's the truth. All right. So, I, I was just, I mean, I hope you already took a second to look at this. I think it's, um, you know, I don't want to sit and spew numbers at you. I will tell you that. Um, we have spent a couple different staff meetings analyzing the STAR 360 and um, our other assessments that we're doing on reading and math. Um, it's been, it's different looking at data like this in teams. It's not like sitting in a room, but I think our biggest takeaways are we're really happy that there isn't some huge learning loss gaps and that our efforts are, are, are working. Um, and so I would say that we are trying to make an emphasis on reading. That's why Mrs. Bowen gives out a reading calendar and rewards kids for reading as much as possible. Um, that's why I know we are trying to reward kids. Also, the Title I staff is sending home a newsletter, rewarding with books as well. So we've been analyzing data with our staff, um, and I've been meeting individually with teachers to look at their classrooms and kids just to see, like, talk with the whole kid and how they're doing in class and anything that's what's surprising to them or not surprising to them. Um, but I think my biggest takeaway is, is that we're doing great, some great stuff in reading, and uh, there have been improvements. And we know we have work to do in math, uh, and we've started that work, but it's going to take a little more time before you're going to see it in the numbers. Um, I think our greatest accomplishment was piloting um, two programs, one on each campus in the elementary. And um, we're right now, I just had a, the teachers do a survey about how those are going so we can figure out what next direction we're going to go in. So um, we, these are, these are our scores. Any questions? So I guess, you know, there's those, these abbreviations at the top, what's, uh, what's BAS and what's PNOA uh, between the reading and the math? Sure. So thank you for being a jargon buster. So PNOA is stands for the primary number observation assessment and it's a, it's a math assessment. Um, and the BAS is the Fountas and Pinnell reading assessment. And so, why the BAS and looking at the stars is really good is because a teacher really reads right with a kid and then it's really based on just this this one-on-one -on -one and listening to comprehension 
So I think a teacher really can see how a kid does, whereas the Star 360 is sitting in front of the computer and click, click, clicking. Um, and so you can't always tell if somebody just clicked through or if they're really giving it their all. So I just, it's like a little feel for what they, how they're a little bit different. I would just add that the, the star also focuses on decoding, uh, sorry, encoding, so spelling. Um, and it also focuses on much more on close reading for comprehension. Like it's, it's more intense as students get older, the more intensive the pa passages get around a close read uh, for comprehension as compared to how fluently do you read and comprehend. Um, because Fauci said when I was picking up on your mistakes and things. Right. So at the middle school level, can you roll up a little, Ray? I don't know if it's up or down, but <clears throat> roll there's the six, eight reading. Uh, it's, I don't think we can write home about this, but the beauty of this is in a pandemic, there hasn't been a drop. And minor gain, but I don't think one point is enough to, to blow a horn over, although I love blowing horns. I can tell you that we, one of the things we did is over the last summer is we're really trying to close gaps in reading, of course, and <clears throat> we're looking at close reading, like Jamie was talking about, because the older you get, you want more strategies with that. The writing strategies that we're working on are brand new to us this school year. We had some, but these are a new set, and it came out of the Middle Grades Institute past summer. And it's, uh, it's agreed upon writing a paragraph that everybody in the middle school agrees is how we're going to do it. So we've been introducing that all year in a pandemic, and we hope to see great gains there. In the math, there's nobody to, no horn to blow, no blowing of horns. Horns are to be put down. We need a lot of growth here. And I think, you know, Andrew's point of like they've lined up some, some programs in the lower grades. We need to also line up our programming. And one of the things we've done, which is really going to be helpful, I think, is we've created a vertical team for mathematics. So grades 5 through 12 are meeting regularly to talk about mathematics and also literacy, two different teams. And Andrew's brought together some, um, I think it's grades 1 through 4 are doing some of that work, similar work. So we're going to have, and we haven't had this since I've been here, a, a vertical team all the way through, which will be helpful. The um, <clears throat> One of the things we did see, and we're going to focus on this more and more, we looked at who took, who scores either dropped dramatically or who took a test and didn't really seem to give it a lot of effort or time. We pulled those kids back in. And we had people sit with them either one-on-one -on -one or three-on-one, small group. And those scores went up dramatically. We'd like to start to create the culture where you don't just blow off any assessment. If you're going to give take an assessment, take it seriously. And if you're not going to take it seriously, we're going to sit with you and help you figure out how to do that. So uh, a little bit painful. <laughs> I was in with a few. There were two sets of tears. One from the teacher, one from the kid, different rooms. But there's, it's important, I think, that we take these steps. And, and when the kid made those gains, that kid that cried, there was a big celebration, not with us, but with them. You could almost see their academic self-esteem swell. So, And we have a new boss that keeps telling us we need to know our data and inside and out. And that when we're presenting it, we better be comfortable doing it. So I hope I did a pretty good job here, I think. But we can get better, too. And I need to know this stuff better. And I can tell you, the person that I've learned the most from this in is Andra. And I think it's not just Andra. It's the elementary model and the mindset of how they look at data and that they're always collecting it. So uh, I'm paying attention. Tag, you're it, Reed. Unless you have questions for me at this section, or you can ask them all at the end. Um, I got a question, or maybe I can at the end. If uh, it's just a general, so I'm just going to throw it out there. Is just wondering, since there's a number of students that are doing this virtual learning exclusively, um, how do you know how engaged they are with taking these 
proficiency exams. I mean, as you were saying, just, you know, you find one that's kind of lax in their final scores and then you sit with them and encourage them. It's a different story. What about the ones that you're not seeing and engaging with in a face-to-face -face way? So we have been able to assess our remote learners um, through the STAR. There has been a way to, to do that at, uh, with them. And actually, all, all the assessments have been given to them, is my understanding. Um, and I haven't heard, I mean, there's always a little lack of the control of like what the environment is, you know? When we give it to them at school, we know what it looks like and sounds like and feels like when they're taking it in their home. That's, there's a, we don't, can't control for some of those factors. But we do know we're also planning on um, the SBAC assessments coming up and that all of our virtual learners will have to be invited in school to take that assessment, which is coming up. So um, I think we have some information about how they are and how they're engaged. Uh, I don't know that I would judge engagement based on their participation on these assessments per se. Well, for this, I would agree there, but also we can see how much time they took. We also, if we know them, we know how they did last time. And if we know them and we know our kids so well, 600 or so kids, we know if their family is in crisis and that their score may be way in the, in the cellar and we're not gonna over bother that family. But so that's the beauty of our smallness, but also the timing is key, Lisa. If we see you took that test in three minutes, you didn't take the test. Um, I also know I've observed a couple of these. So. I bet you have. Okay. So I know the younger kids, the teachers like doing it as a presentation basically and entering the answers as the teachers directly involved, but at least for the younger kids. <laughs> And it probably depends on the assessment, Andrew. <coughs> one, of the, one of the things at the high school level we've seen with the virtual kids is uh, this real spread. We've got uh, you know, almost nobody in the middle. We've got uh, a little bit more than half the kids who are knocking, knocking the test out of the ballpark. Uh, and then we've got a slightly smaller group, about 45%. Um, who also correlate with the students who are, are less engaged in class and, and aren't completing work, uh, and probably who really do have some reading and math difficulties um, for what that's worth. Now, you know, because they're taking it home, it, it's not a reliable test uh, because who knows if they, you know, what they actually did as far as trying goes, uh, or whether or not they, I mean, the odds are they, they didn't do well because they cheated, but they could have looked up answers on their phone uh, to help them along the way or, or whatnot. So uh, it, it's data, but it, it's really limited and, it, and it's not included in our percentages uh, with the high school numbers here. Um, with uh, grades nine, 10, uh, again, when we, we look at these numbers over three different periods of time, we're not looking at the same students last year taking the test this year. The 10th graders who took it last year have moved on to 11th grade and aren't part of this year's numbers. And part of this year's numbers are last year's eighth graders. Uh, so it's, it, it's a little bit problematic to say that these percent proficient numbers show growth because they're different kids. Uh, but again, as Owen mentioned before, we didn't see a decline. Uh, we, we saw an increase in the number of ninth and 10th graders who are proficient in reading go from 48% to 59% uh, when we administered the test in January. Uh, what, what's more relevant is that when we gave the test in the fall, we had 57% proficient and 59% proficient in the winter. And, and there could be two factors tied to that. One is uh, we've done a little bit of work school-wide to promote reading instruction across all classes uh, in teaching all students a particular reading strategy to help them be able to identify the author's point of view, which is one of the areas or is the area that uh, the test has shown us that our students struggle the most with. So, so part of the beauty of the data is it helps us to see what uh, learning expectations uh, students aren't doing well in so that we can target uh, instruction across the board 
at improving that skill level across the student body. Uh, so we're working on that with a literacy team and a little bit of professional development there. Uh, but the other thing that we've, we've really been, been increasingly working with is direct reading intervention. Um, and we, we have a program across the district called Di Direct Instruction, where we're pulling small groups of kids uh, to work one, well, in small groups with a trained direct instructor or direct instruction teacher uh, for 45, 50 minutes. Uh, in high school, we're only able to do that two times a week. Uh, but we have four groups at different reading levels working intensively to bring up their reading abilities, uh, reading skills. So that increase from fall to winter could be reflective of some of those efforts. Uh, and, and hopefully, you know, a real test would be, do we see that number go up again when we do the test in May? And we should. So uh, moving into math, our, our numbers proficient are not as strong. And uh, we, we really have identified this as one of our areas that, that we need to do more with the intervention on. What can we do to help these students? Uh, it, it does make sense that math is much more sequential, going from uh, <clears throat> you know eighth grade math, pre-algebra, algebra to geometry. Uh, we're we're not a hundred percent comfortable that we we understand what the Star 360 high school tests are assessing. So we're we're doing a lot of homework and investigation into the the composition of that test and what benchmarks it's using to assess students uh, with. And hopeful that as we un unpack the data in the test itself, that uh, we'll find some areas for improvement. Uh, finally, uh, you know, one of one of the other things that that we really need to work on is how to get a higher level of completion uh, across the student body. Uh, so we're administering these in in English and math classes, which is is great. Um, but they're, every day there are going to be a couple kids who are absent. And if a student is sick on Monday, uh, they may not be back in school by the end of the week when we do the, the retake. Uh, and what we, we don't have is uh, resources in the building to chase after kids uh, who might be on a 10-day quarantine when the test is administered uh, to be able to follow up with them three weeks later to, to make up that test. So we've identified that as an area of growth uh, and just making the, the data overall more a part of something that kids care about. You know, by the time they're ninth and 10th grade, they're like, oh, we've been doing this for eight years, this again. Uh, and so there are some students that don't put very much into it. Um, and, uh, you know, Owen's idea, what they did this past winter of, of assigning someone to, to pull kids out and sit with them to make sure they're doing their best is something that I think could go a long way towards picking up our high school scores. Uh, and that's the conclusions we got from the high school data. Any questions about any of that? Is, is the STARS 360, is it computer based at the high school level too? Yeah. So for those kids that are sick or in quarantine, would they be able to do it? remotely at home uh, instead of waiting until they come back to campus? Uh, in theory, they could, uh, but we wouldn't consider their results reliable. So the, the preference would be to catch up with them when they get back to school, but you know, if they've been sick for a week, pull them out of class when they're trying to get caught up is also problematic. So uh, really need to come up with a better system for, for retakes. Are there certain don't test well with STAR 360? And, and if so, what's the percentage? And what do you do to, to uh, I don't know, represent them well? You know, the, that I fear is that there's a student that tests poorly, and I was one of them. They leave that feeling less than and less capable, lower self-esteem, et cetera. So how do you manage that? 
I think what helps is that we do it so frequently. Uh, I do think when we started some of these assessments, there was a lot of test anxiety and, you know, a lot of big push. It was just worrisome. But now that we've done it so frequently, I think we, we also recognize it's a moment in time. It's a piece of information. It's not the whole student. It's, it's just a snapshot. So I think what we really are trying to teach is that taking tests is something you have to do in life. And so some of that's like about persevering through things like this. And then I think it's really about looking at growth and not necessarily like, oh, look at how great you are. It's about, hey, you know, you did this better this time or you're working on this and just more of a growth mindset than a, hey, you're there. So I don't know if that helps answer your, your question, Lisa, but I, th I think we've gotten better at giving tests in the time that we've been doing it or assessing really, it's more about assessing than giving tests. And I think the kids, it's become more normal for them to know that we're just monitoring their progress. Yeah, it, that kind of makes, I mean, I understand the more frequent testing how it's becoming more um, normal for it. But uh, I just think, you know, students comparing, you know, how did you do, what was your score compared to my score? And if they can see personal gains, that's, that's great. That's one thing, but there's always the comparison, the competitiveness between students comes to play and just hoping that there's other ways that uh, comprehension and intelligence and creativity is being supported and encouraged and recognized so that this isn't the only you know maybe this is for certain you know, for the school but that hopefully there's other ways for the students to be empowered if this isn't one i absolutely think there are lisa i'll just add and maybe only can jump in. I mean, it's part of why I think we have to have more authentic assessment and more demonstrations of learning with the greater community. Um, and so one of the action items um, that we're going to be looking to address that connects to the SU goal number two around personalized learning and pathways are legacy projects. Um, and so I'm looking to leverage some of our ESSER money to develop additional support um, and collaboration at each school um, so that we have some type of legacy project that occurs as a real celebration of student learning and achievement that allows them to engage in a, in a personal learning project, but then also showcase it. I also think that that will set us up better so when our students get into secondary at the high school level, that they're actually used to having folks say, what is it that you are interested in learning? And what is it that you wanna do? I think if we just wait till they're in ninth grade to start asking those questions, it's way too late. So um, that's something that we're gonna be looking to start really engaging in as we move forward across the SU. I have this vision that we'll look back and see that this is really slices of small slices and that we create a culture in our school where kids wanna prove what they know whether through a legacy project, capstone project, passion project, or through an assessment like this. There are some kids that thrive in these assessments also, and we need to recognize them. I know of some high schools where they had everybody take the SAT or the PSAT. And again, it's practice, practice, practice. And then there's some families and kids that are like, that's not my thing. But we wanna know that you know how because we don't want to send you out the world without those skills. But we also, I agree with Jamie, if you can show us what you know and we can help you polish it, we're going to be the school that people want to be at. When, what we, when we approach assessment and evaluation as a celebration, that's when we're going to be there. And I know schools do this. I know other schools around us have done it. Randolph's done a great job with their senior project. But I think Jamie's talking about regular legacy, like you're working on your project. It's not an event. It's the way we do business. Um, one quick comment on the start of the 60s stuff. I'm pretty sure it's an adaptive narrative so it tries to adjust to the level. But one thing with that is that the kids wind up seeing stuff that they, you know, don't know for sure because the, the, that's the point where they're getting things wrong and for, there are some kids who you know that get frustrating for so maybe making sure to com communicate and emphasize that that's going to happen that you're not 
Um, my other question just on the, or comment on the presentation of the data, is it possible to get um, something that looks like a report showing, you know, average growth per student or something like that? You know, right now we're seeing a snapshot of the overall thing, but it'd be interesting to have the data in some way that shows individual student progress from test to test aggregated. You know what I mean? So that when we're jumping from eighth grade to ninth grade, those are completely different students, but we can look at those scores from eighth grade to ninth grade to see like how those the students that we have that are the same progress in that time. So I don't know. Yeah, we can start sharing with you as we get more and more efficient at this, Andrew. Uh, cohort growth, right. both by percentage and scale growth. Good. Yeah, I think one of the things we that we're I'm hopeful that we're getting better at in data teams is looking at the scale score growth and expected rate of growth around scale score. Um, the other thing was there was two links in that um, on that page on your principal's report, and the second one I was we weren't able I wasn't able to access uh, permissions wise. Is that the social emotional data report, Andrew? And we're going to go over that next month and we'll update the data. That's on the okay. SU data okay. calendar for next month. Andrew, just get excited and jump the gun. Okay. Um, this is Lisa. Just one more thing that um, I'm hoping I would love to add to a future agenda for, for a future board meeting is to learn a little bit more about uh, Regeneration Core, which is uh, a curriculum that's being utilized in, uh, at the Randolph High School and the Sharon Academy and a couple other schools that um, allows for flexible pathways and um, proficiency-based learning Etc. There's a website link, and it's it's in its second year of um, of actually being in place. And somebody from that organization approached me last year to see if our our if Rudd was interested in being involved or looking at the curriculum and how they could uh, work with the group at Regeneration Core. And it was right when COVID was happening, so it really wasn't a good time. But I would love to see if we could add that to a future agenda and I could send you guys links so you could look at for future discussions. Because it, when we're talking about um, uh, racial equality and, and BIPOC communities and, and, and just, you know, all of the social justice, et cetera, that all gets tied in with this um, curriculum along with agriculture, which is of course, my thing. <laughs> yeah, Lisa, it'd be great if you could connect us with them. I would love to, and I'd be, I'll, should I, um, I'll connect it with you and the principals then, yeah. and maybe I'll include the board members so everybody can look at the website. Super. They would be very excited. That sounds great, Lisa. Thanks. Great. All right, does anybody have anything else on the, about the data? reports. Okay, we'll move on to the next agenda item, which is the results of the 21-22 annual budget meeting vote. Um, so I'll just jump in here and say we had a real successful vote, I thought, and I think I've received a lot of positive feedback about the information we provided. It was really helpful for folks and informative. Um, so just thank you all for your work and attention to that. Um, and I'll let you know that uh, I've got an ad ready to go in the paper next week, calling on folks to apply um, for the vacant seat in South Royalton. Um, and that I would look for the deadline to be the Friday, the submission of applicants uh, prior to our next regular meeting. And then we could warn at the regular meeting, an opportunity for the board um, to meet with candidates 
if there's multiple candidates, which would be terrific, right? If there was. Um, and if not, I do know um, that Peggy Ainsworth is interested in um, serving on the board. Um, and so those of you who don't know Peggy, she is um, a retired school teacher and also um, dairy farmer. Um, in South Royalton and had served on the select board in the past and has two grandchildren in our schools. And so Peggy had spoken to me a few times prior to the election and then uh, her and I spoke again today and she does plan to submit a letter of interest. And that would be just to fill the remainder of this, of course, this next year. And then she could choose whether or not she wanted to run for that seat or if other folks, of course, would have the opportunity to run too. You just fill it for the year. Right, that sounds good. And um, in addition to the ad being in the paper, I assume we'll post it on the Facebook page so we can share it around. Yeah, we'll use the same verbiage. Yep, and get it posted okay. out. All right, uh, unless there's anything else, we'll move on to 9.3, the food service. So you're the last district that I've discussed this with. Uh, and Tara, while I'm talking, if you could start to look at those numbers around our projected savings, that would be great. I'm buying you some time. Um, and so, good. All right. It's a low machine. And so uh, he here's what I would say about food service. There's a few things that we have to consider. One, um, quality across the SU is not the same everywhere. And so I'm interested in us learning from each other. And uh, Shannon, I'm glad you brought this up. I think that you know we have some folks doing a really good job of navigating COVID-19 and it doesn't look the same in every school around our product. And of course, every school is a little different in size too, right? Um, but we have some trained chefs within the SU now. Um, and so we're looking to capitalize on their expertise, capitalize on menu planning across the SU, also bulk purchasing and not having redundancy. Right now in every district, I have folks menu planning, purchasing, doing meal time. It's just, we're very redundant. And so the idea is that we better streamline that. Um, so I think we can find some efficiencies there in savings. We're looking at what's working in certain buildings in regards to menu planning. So. You know, there's certain buildings that have some rocking breakfast items that we don't necessarily capitalize on across the SU. And additionally, um, we're just, I don't think we're strategically purchasing. And so there would be an emphasis on strategically purchasing as well. This doesn't mean that fresh fruits and vegetables goes away. Doesn't mean we're still not going to really emphasize um farm to school and frankly that's one of the things you all have in common overall is that you're really passionate about that so if anything i would look at how do we increase it what this really means is that we're actually going to tend to the state statute which says that food service is supposed to be one enterprise fund under the guise of the su um, which will assist us a great deal in regards to navigating um, compliance but also increasing efficiencies. The, there's a savings across the SU. It's under 100,000, what we project. Um, I think it's like 98 or so um, that we're projecting for an annual savings. So that's not huge. I'm not saying that this is gonna be the end all be all, but it's certainly better than no savings. And the other thing we have to take into account, I believe the legislature is going to pass a bill that is going to, um, there's going to be a lead up time. And I'm certainly supportive of it. And the fact that it's going to provide free meals to all Vermont public school students. What I'm currently advocating against is the fact that they're not going to provide funding to help support that. And so I know that there's a big push right now from the VSA, the Vermont Super Superintendents Association to say, we're all in support of this, but you gotta think about how you're gonna assist with paying for it. Um, and so I think the more we can start to work in a more unified way to handle this, the better, um, because 
uh, that's going to be a significant change for us in regards to providing meals um, to everyone. And I do believe that there's a great deal of momentum for that to pass. Tara, what was the projected savings for RUN? $39,732.79. And that is based on what we're doing over the last two years. And we base the projected savings on not the USDA um, reimbursement for every meal. That's a savings based on us going back to the old model around the National Food Program and free and reduced lunch reimbursement, which is less than we currently receive. And of course, it's only for those who are free or reduced. Um, so that's figuring in a savings based on us going back to our old model. We do know that the USDA programs extended through September of next year. Um, and I'm still hopeful that there could be more assistance provided um, in order to continue a high quality meal programming. And Tara, one of the things I got to dig into is whether or not there's an opportunity around student wellness and us able to capitalize additionally on some of our ESSER funds to assist our food service program. Absolutely. Um, how would the savings depend on, I mean, I would think that the savings would be in the expense side, not the revenue side, as far as like what our reimbursements are. So. Was yep. It, the projected savings is essentially all around finding efficiencies in purchasing. We, we don't expect a great deal of savings in personnel at this point, Andrew, and personnel is really the driver of the cost for us. Um, and so that's why we are not able to project anything more than what we're projecting. I do hope that as we increase the quality of product that our participation goes up. We have certain buildings right now where petition participation is much greater um, than other buildings. And so I'm hopeful that would the you know especially to around adults participating in the food service program uh because that is a revenue stream so i think the better quality product we have the more that adults may participate um is there a participation rate that would basically let us break even or anything like that no, I, I don't ever see us breaking even because the driver for us is personnel cost. And when we say like we've always had the $53,000 in our budget to subsidize food service. So when like I'm when we say breaking even, is it like breaking even at that level so that we're not going further into deficit or is it breaking even as in not having to subsidize food service at all? Breaking even to me would be not to subsidize food service, right? No, we're going to have to have some type of subsidy provided by all the districts. The idea though, is that this would be a retroactive approach to budgeting around the new enterprise fund. So we run it for the year, we see how we do, and then we bill back that assessment for next year. So you'll know what to budget in every district for fiscal year 22-23. Um, and that will be based off of how we projected 20 and sorry, 21, 22. So it'd be real numbers. And so that we just clean the books every year. And so that we're not, we're not trying to play catch up. And meanwhile, the good news is if we are able to tap into some additional federal funds, that would allow us to not be, you know, it would allow us to get through this next year or two. Because we know that ESSER 3 is going to run for quite some time. So my hope is that we're able to tap into some of that. I'm still awaiting some further guidance. I asked that question, Tara, with Jeff Francis uh, last week, and he didn't have an answer for me. I just didn't know if he had heard, because he's very involved right now in the legislature around the uh, universal uh, lunch. Yeah, my conversation with the food service child nutrition program director the other day was that they're still waiting for additional guidance on how any additional funding is going to come through for child nutrition program. And a lot of that depends on what the USDA agrees to do. Um, I would just add that our um, our staff, we've met on this several times. They're supportive of it, uh, partly because it builds in a bench for them, too. 
we have multiple um, districts where if the cook goes out, there's like no one other than a sub. And there's still the whole process of mealtime and ordering. And so they're excited that they could better support each other um, as a unified system. And um, I also just had a meeting with the union today and they're in support of it. So, I mean, re there's really, there's not any pushback around us looking to bring this under the SU umbrella under one enterprise fund. Um, the staff seem to be supportive um, around it. And I think it's important that this is this is not a conversation about contracted service. This is about just centralizing food service. Would the billing for it be basically based on usage? So, you know, or would it be assessed on, you know, kind of like the SU budget is as far as percentages or something? You know, Andrew, one of the things I want us to take up at the SU board after we reorg in June is assessment in general, because I think we need to just revisit that conversation across the SU. Um, so I think that's food service, special ed, and your regular um, supervisory union assessment. So I don't have an answer for you because I think we need to talk about it. Um, but I think we need to talk about it across all three areas. And it, but it could be either. It could be either. I mean, it could be direct bill back. Um, but I just I I don't have an answer for how you guys are going to want to approach it as an SU. Sure. I mean, that would make the most sense to me. But um, you know, I guess that is a discussion. Like, we need to look kind of more directly into the finances in order to see. You know, if if you're saying there there is a fairly big difference in uptake and stuff like that in different um places you know then presumably the costs are fairly different as well and that's the case with all your assessments right yep and special ed's the same way um so i just again i think it's it's a greater conversation you're not direct build back on special ed i mean that's that's the biggest cost you have right now um and that's that's assessed out across the su so And I'm not suggesting we should direct bill back. I just, again, I think so. We, I, I don't know if everyone understands how that works and I wanna educate folks and have a conversation around it. Okay. Yeah, I'd be curious because like, yeah, I don't know how that works and what options we would have, you know, how much is in statute as far as how it's billed and stuff like that on the special education anyway. Um, okay. Does anybody have any food service related questions for there? So just so folks know, this will be on the agenda and I'm gonna look for the SU board to consider action on it. Um, it's been supported by all the other districts. So I think that we actually may be able to move on this one. Um, and like I said, Andrew, in regards to how we build back, direct build back absolutely could occur. Um, and just, again, I can't speak for how other folks feel about it. Um, would others like to give feedback for Jamie? What are you guys thinking as far as whether this is something we'd like to do or not? I think we had talked about this a lot when we had Willie at, at our site, um, and trying to, um, leverage that expertise um, across to use it across the SU. I think it makes sense to try to um, use the expertise we have in, in the two sites to do the menu planning and things like that and um, and maybe take away some of their everyday everyday bookkeeping things that could be done by somebody else, you know, um, that they should be working to the full, you know, scope of their, their professional um, expertise. Well said, Shannon, I agree. I just hope that, you know, I'm going to be part of a community garden in Bethel again this year and hope that we can bring food to the Bethel campus on a regular basis to um, get incorporated with meals or however it can be used. 
So I hope that that um, doesn't become a, a challenge. Yeah, I, I wonder. The more the merrier, Lisa. Great. Yeah, I wonder too if there are partnerships to be made um, in the area with thing, things like your your local garden. But also, I know there was a program a couple of years ago where a bunch of kids made uh, bread. They had King Arthur flour come in and teach them how to make bread, and they donated bread to the local food banks. And um, I think you know maybe there's there are things that could be done in that those areas too. Um, you know, looking at bringing people into the, the school. So just, yes, yeah. if each, if each campus isn't required to do all that bookkeeping and ordering and th some of those chat, you know, things that probably aren't what they're in there for are, are managed by somebody else. Maybe there'll be some more time for some creative educational community based opportunities to go around food. So that's, in, you know, I, I hope that that is something that can come out of this as well. All right. Um, I think we're probably ready to move on to, um, I guess this would be on to the Bethel eating presentation. So it's my pleasure uh, to introduce you to Lyle Smith. And this might be the first time you've seen Lyle. Facilities committees met Lyle. Um, Lyle has been a real uh, godsend for us in regards to uh, joining the SU team this year to assist Tara and I around all things uh, maintenance facilities and preventative maintenance plans. And so Lyle has been working diligently on helping us navigate some real trouble areas, including the Bethel heating system. Um, and I gotta say, I've been so pleased. I mean, we've been able to keep schools open without having to shut down due to utilities. Um, and Lyle has been a big part of that. And so we've got some, some real need in that almost every building across the SU, uh, but other buildings who are certainly in much more emergent, uh, you know, in the more of a more intensive need if we were thinking about intervention to intervene um, around our physical plant. And Bethel is one of those. Um, and so Lyle brought uh, Mike Davey to Tara and I to do a presentation based on the work that he does with EEI services. Is that correct, Mike? Um, and uh, some of the SUs and districts he's worked with. I um, certainly uh, look up to their leadership at the SU office, but I've also been in their facilities and um, they've done great work. And so tonight, Mike's here to just educate the board on how the process would work. And then I would be looking for the board to discuss whether or not they at least want to start the process in regards to um, getting an RFP up so that we can start to get folks to see what interest may be in doing an audit. Um, and pre presenting us with a plan of how we might be able to move forward. So Lyle and Mike, welcome. Thanks. So first off, uh, lunch is m the favorite part of my day. So I've shared our food service director at the Williston schools where I work, who's now going through the same thing as you are. So uh, I gave you his number, Jamie. He's a great resource and he's, he's going through exactly what you're going through right now. But uh, anyway, so uh, I, I'm not sure if you want to hear from me first or, or Mike about what we're thinking about the, the boiler system. So it, it's, it's steam, you which go is, lay, on, lay, out, lay it out. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it, it's problematic because it's a steam system. The steam piping is failing. Uh, we've had to do some major patching and just to get through this, the season. Um, and it's not as simple as just switching over the boilers from steam to hot water because you've got lots of devices that depend on steam throughout the building to provide heat. So it's, you got to do the conversion of the steam equipment in the building, um, the coils and so on, before you can switch the boilers over to hot water. So that was one strategy we had thought, well, uh, change all the piping that's in bad and poor condition and make sure we've got enough piping going to and coming back. The different piping arrangement also. 
So um, we've also thought, well, maybe we should get away from oil. That's another you know thing that's on everybody's mind and go to some sort of renewable. So pellet boilers are something that we've been looking at. Of course, to do all this at once is, is very costly. Um, the, the thing about schools that have not kept up with the latest technologies and efficiencies is that there's a lot of low hanging fruit as far as um, what savings can be had if you do efficiency upgrades. So the whole performance contracting, uh, and Mike will speak to this better than I can, um, is to basically pay for a project, an upgrade like this, with the money that you would otherwise have spent on fuel that is just really inefficient. Um, so I think we've got, as along with many schools in Vermont that I have personally inspected, uh, have a lot of opportunity to do things more efficiently, get away from fossil fuels, and um, recoup the, the savings and put them into our buildings rather than into some fuel dealer's pocket essentially. And that's how I look at it. So uh, I think this is a good opportunity for us to, to really do something better with our dollars. And I think I'll, I'll give it to you, Mike. Uh, yeah, so I'm um, Mike Davey. Thanks. Thanks for setting that up, Lyle. Um, I work for a company, Energy Efficient Investments. Um, we've worked with many Vermont school districts um, looking at their existing buildings and and thinking about how to make them more efficient and, and how to have the energy savings help pay for those improvements. I have a quick PowerPoint tonight and, and Ray, will, will I be able to um, move the PowerPoint or we, no? Okay, so I guess we'll just go to the next slide. So our company has been around since 2007. Um, we are a local New England based company. Um, next slide. Um, when we do a performance contract, what we're really talking about is, is finding a way for the energy savings to help pay for the improvements in your building. Um, and it's, it's a turnkey approach. It starts with an energy audit. We will use any other previous facility studied or energy audits that have been done, um, but we'll compl complete a, an updated one based on current pricing look at what options there may be to improve the building. And, you know, for, for this, this building I toured in Bethel, looking at getting off of steam, going to hot water, going to perhaps a wood heat uh, would be all things we would look at um, and, and give you the payback on doing those things. Uh, we do the construction and we guarantee the energy savings. So that allows us when we go out to, um, uh, to fund the project, to have the the guaranteed energy savings really help fund the um, the project, and we we guarantee that funding for the life of the project. Uh, next slide. Some of the districts that we have done work in uh, Addison Northwest, with it, which is Virgins and the surrounding towns, uh, Bennington, Vermont. Uh, Mill River, which is uh, Clarendon and the surrounding towns. We have done every project every building in the Hanover Norwich School District. Um, the city of Manchester, New Hampshire, which is the largest city in northern New England, we've done work in all 22 schools in the city. Uh, and then Portsmouth and Keene as well. Uh, next slide. Um, in 2020, a lot of districts in Vermont called us to apply for Efficiency Vermont grants, grants to help uh, implement ventilation improvements for the pandemic. Um, and so we were able to do some projects and I know that there were some done in Bethel as well, um, it, but Addison, Springfield, Mill River, Norwich, uh, Two Rivers and Chittenden and Burlington and one Catholic school, Mount St. Joseph Academy in Rutland. Um, <laughs> some, some projects that we've done in um, Vermont include a comprehensive project we did for the um, Addison Northwest. We did a $7.6 million project. The energy savings paid 60% of the annual bond payment. So it really lowered the tax impact of this project and included all new ventilation, all new lighting, uh, removal of the steam heat and going to hot water, solar 
PV and new roofing. The only downside to doing this project is we did this before all the federal money became available. So, uh, you know, that's the downside of being proactive. It, the good side of waiting is there's a lot more federal money around now to do these types of projects. Next slide. Uh, in Mill River, which is again, Clarendon area, they wanted us to only focus on projects that would completely pay for themselves. So they wanted us to bring up a project to their taxpayers that over a 20 year period would be guaranteed to save uh, more than any financing cost. So we were able to do um, a $2 million project that included a, a wood chip plant at the high school, LED lighting, uh, building controls and analytics. What analytics is, is we monitor the performance of the building monthly from an energy standpoint. Oh, this graph came, it looks funny in this, in this, uh, in this presentation. It's the, with the screen squished, it, those are uh, millions of dollars. So their look came out a little funky, but um, in general, Manchester School District, this is, this is a graphical way to look at it. Back in 2009, before they started focusing on energy efficiency, Manchester schools in New Hampshire were spending 3.5 million in annual energy cost. Once they focused on energy efficiency, we were able to get their annual energy budget down below $2 million. So that's $1.5 million in savings with still heating, cooling, and lighting the same square footage as they were in 2009. Um, so a lot why the Vermont school districts have chosen us, I think a lot, we are local. We have um, Vermont-based project management, Vermont-based engineer. Uh, we use local controls uh, and equipment, so we don't manufacture anything. We use the local products um, and we manage every step of the project. So we, we manage the entire thing from the audit to the construction to the completion. Um, this is this is a graphical way to talk about how it works. So I mentioned numerous times that these projects pay for themselves or they can pay for themselves like in Mill River. Um, this is just a graphical way to think about your budget. So this is the, the budget from Belmont High School in um, New Hampshire. And in general, what I said to them is they were spending $120,000 per year to heat and light and run ventilation for their school. If they didn't do a project, they could just keep keep status quo. And for the next 10 years, it would be pay about 120,000 plus or minus. Uh, if they did an energy efficiency project, and in this case, it was um, new lights, HVAC controls, we said we could finance that project for six years. So they keep their energy budget essentially the same for six years. But the fuel, the fuel goes down to like 95,000. And then there was a lease payment for uh, 25,000 for six years. And then in year seven, they start making a profit on the investment or they start being able to reduce their budget by that 25,000. So th this is just conceptually how it works. You kind of keep your fuel budgets the same, but for, for the period of the, the energy payback, um, um, you, you're, it's budget neutral and then year seven, in this example, seven through 10, it's bu budget positive. So if you were to do a project like, like lighting and controls and insulation, those things tend to have paybacks in this range of under 10 years. If you'd wanna dive deeper and do boilers and ventilation and window upgrades, those projects, and, and that's typically what Vermont schools do. They, they typically have a lot of needs and they, they typically don't wanna just do lights and controls. They, they wanna blend everything. So it's more typical for our customers in Vermont to finance these over 20 year periods um, and to go more comprehensive. They certainly don't have to, but that's been the trend and, and it's been pretty successful. Um, in another example is like for Jens, it, was, it didn't completely pay for itself but it was a project they absolutely had to do and they were able to tell the taxpayers that listen uh, the energy savings will pay for 60 percent of the bond cost so the budget hit was only the, the 40 percent uh, next slide um i think i talked about we'll skip this one. Oh, well, uh, one quick thing at the end of that is um 
we don't charge. So if you do, a, so Vermont law requires you to do a proposal. You, you, even if you, I do a really good job tonight, you can't just hire me. Um, you have to do an RFP. There are other companies that do this work. Um, and one of the things that separates us are we don't charge for the audit. So if you do the RFP, you hire us, we do an audit, you don't like it or the voters don't like it, you don't pay anything. So you don't have to come up with money right now to pay for the audit. We do, we do that at our risk, assuming we can find enough savings and can create a compelling enough project that you'll vote for it and then the voters will vote for it. Next slide. Uh, this is the Addison Northwest, I think I have an extra letter in there, um, Addison Northwest School District. And they, prior to us working together, they were spending 470,000 a year in energy budget. Um, in the, the, the year after we did the project, which is 18 and 19, they went from 470,000 a year to 226,000 a year. So that's a one year uh, savings of 255,000. Which was more than we guarantee. It was more than we um, projected. So they actually saved sixty-five thousand more than the than uh, we were projecting. But you know, it's basically a, a, a neighboring Vermont school district that cut their energy costs in half by going through this process in the very. And it's also um, a really cool project to tour. They, the, I was really impressed with this board. They were very forward-thinking. They did almost everything we recommended and the results kind of prove that out. So if you ever did want to tour Virgen's high school and look at some of the stuff, we, we could set that up after the uh, pandemic is over, I'm sure. Oh, there's actually a website too. There's a video result I could send uh, to Jamie that he could distribute um, that uh, you could click on it now, but it's 18 minutes and I'm guessing you don't want to uh, <laughs> hang around for that. Uh, next slide. But I will send it to Jamie and you can forward it out um, in lieu of a tour. Um, and any, um, so, so that's the, the concept. Um, I think Lyle and Jamie set it up. Uh, if, if this is attractive, you do an RFP, us and other maybe competitors may or may not submit. Um, we don't charge for the audit. And then um, uh, you, what we try and tell districts is when should you engage in this and in general, if, if your districts need ventilation, lighting, boiler improvements, it's worth thinking about. It's especially worth thinking about if the buildings are going to be in your fleet for the next 10 years. So in general, everything we're looking at is gonna have a 10 year or longer payback outside of lighting and controls. So if there's uncertainty about the building futures, and sometimes that happens in Vermont, um, I'll tell you in Virgins, there was a lot of uncertainty among um, one of the sending schools, Addison. I think they only had 18 or 20 students that one year. And so so there was a lot of thought about whether we should look at those buildings or not. So, but if, if you're thinking that these buildings will be with you for, um, for um, um, let's say more than 10 years, um, then it's, it might be worth considering this process. I guess, any questions? So just so the board knows, I mean, really all I need from you is for you to uh, approve us to pursue the RFP um and to collect bids um first branch unified district provided us that permission um this month and so we've got one more stop at rochester stockbridge um and then if if the you know we're gonna we're gonna put it out for at least first branch anyways but my thought process was if we could bundle it in regards to just the bidding process um that made sense so we could put out an rfp in regards to seeing who may be willing to work um, with our different districts. Okay. Um, I guess one question I have would be, um, it, it, from one of the slides that had the 5% interest on the, you know, basically over the life of the, the financing, is that typical basically as far as like the difference between if you just went and got a bond and funded it all locally versus doing it? Um, 
Right. So right, we, the financing is done either. So historically, so I got to update those slides because I forgot interest rates have plummeted. Um, but in, in general, um, we we um, we fund it. The, we fund it either through Vermont Bond Bank or through Municipal Leasing Corp out of Grand Isle, Vermont. Um, Vermont Bond Bank um, tends to, um, right now, I think they are sub 2% and Municipal Leasing is like 2.3, 2.4%. There's, there's some benefits to leasing. Um, the, the, for, with leasing, you, um, the boards actually have some authority to enter into leases for less than 10 years without and putting it in the budget without necessarily um, doing a specific warrant article. Typically the bonds are, are almost always specific warrant articles um, that have to be voted on at a town meeting or with a special meeting. And so you guys guarantee the energy savings? Is there kind of a cost for that guarantee or is it it's basically built into our our model it's so so we get paid um basically as the general contractors with a guarantee on the savings is how we make our money okay. uh does anybody else have any other questions or comments or discussion and right, it seems certainly seems to me to be worth pursuing um, you know, starting the process anyway. Yeah, I. Go ahead, Lisa. Do we need a board vote on on this for Jamie? Yeah, just if you could move for Tara and I to pursue um, the request for um, proposals, uh, that would let us move forward to the next step. They get, we have to put this plan in front of Efficiency Vermont too. Um, prior to there's a step there that's just required by statute the way these this process works um and so we would do that get the rfp out and then we would be coming back to you after um in regards to you know who who did show interest and uh, i don't know who will or who won't the example is uh, a company like honeywell does this type of work too uh, and lyle's had experience with someone like honeywell what Lyle has explained to me is, is they're very interested in selling their product. Um, and so at times I think they may gut the system more than someone who doesn't actually have that type of product to sell. And so um, that that's just something that we'll have to weigh when bids come in. And I don't know if they'll bid for us or not, add out for us or not. The other thing I'm very interested in is who our current providers are for a heating system and making certain we have folks that can service them regularly and get parts where I know Wiles talked to me about a company like Honeywell. Um, they don't really have regional, uh, the, the closest parts and uh, service is like in New York state, right, Lyle? Like it's not local. Yeah, they're, they're not always just close by, unfortunately. Um, yeah, there's Johnson Controllers, Honeywell, uh, the Siemens, a lot of places do this, but again, they're, they're quite interested in selling you their their product, which is fine in many cases. Um, it doesn't always work well for Vermont because of where Vermont. Um, I have a pretty good comfort level with this um, friend of mine who ran SAU 70, went to work for Mike after he retired and has nothing but good things to say about this company, um, for good things about the schools that they've been in. Um, so my comfort level is pretty high. I, I, I actually like the fact that Efficiency Vermont um, uh, is required to, to look over any contract like this to make sure everything is, is looking good and makes sense for Vermont schools. I think that was a smart move on the legislature's part. Um, so I think it's probably a, a good move for us to, to look into this. Um, the other thing that is strange about these times is that um, Efficiency Vermont has some money for ventilation and, and we're um, pushing them hard. Uh, one of the vendors that we work with has actually said, you know, you're, you're talking about indoor air quality and you're only allow, allowing us to do certain things with this money for indoor air quality. 
Meanwhile, if we can't heat the air, the quality of the air is not so good. So uh, we're in that position where eventually uh, the steam piping is going to fail to the point where we can't heat the air, so it's not going to make much difference. Um, so he's pushing hard to get as many dollars as he can. Um, so all of that is right now in our favor if, if we can be successful here. So um, strange times. I'd entertain a motion to uh, ex uh, start the application process or our RFC process. I make a motion to have uh, Jamie and Tara start the RFP process. How's that? Am I missing anything? That's good. I guess for an RFP process for energy efficiency upgrades in our buildings, maybe. I'll second. Okay, any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, any opposed? I'm going passed? to, yeah, I'm going to abstain because I wasn't oh. here for most of the discussion. You're going to love it though, Lisa. They, I, we can bring you up to speed. Yeah, I'm positive that I will. I just don't feel like I can. No, I think that was a wise choice. Okay. All right. Is that all Thank you need? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lyle. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I guess we're done with that agenda item and I think we've done the action items. So we're on to new hires. Was there any new hires? Okay, then right on to public comment. Any public comment? Um, I don't think we have any other um, for future agenda items. Um, question on public comment. Um, <laughs> So the report to the board, the principal's report had two reports at the tail end of it. And Andrew had asked about the second one and Andra had advised more will be forthcoming. On the first report, um, I wasn't able to access it. So representing general public, um, do they outreach to um, White River Valley SUIT to get access to look at that information? No, Tammy, every other board we what we do is we take that report it's pdf'd and it's part of the packet so i'm going to ask that the principal just send that to christy and we'll get it in the packet okay okay i'm just learning here so thank you i have a quick question um before we adjourn about it's it's march how are we doing on um on our looking at bringing in tuition students and recruitment in the age of COVID, Lord Almighty. Um, we, uh, we set up two tours for uh, prospective ninth graders today. Uh, hope to do that next week. And uh, the high school anyways, we're planning some outreach with the Tunbridge community where there are, uh, I think there are nine students uh, right now who may be uncommitted. So we are also looking at a longer range plan. So because we have found ourselves behind the, um, the curve on this and we're gonna get better at that. There's also some kids in Sharon and on the west coast of the SU that I wanna check in on too. Some families and see what they're up to. Oh, um, Owen, any thoughts on um... I mean, we already have our sixth graders in um, in the middle school. I'm just wondering any thoughts on bringing sixth graders over and saying, hey, isn't this great? You know, look at what you could be doing. No. Yeah. Just because from Sharon and, and places west. We did do that when it wasn't pandemic. Right. Yeah, there's that, right? Come on over right. and get COVID. Yeah. No. Uh, we will do similar things again. We also, right now, a bunch of sixth graders are making 
um, some marketing videos from the sixth grader perspective of why you would want to come to this school. Awesome. So those are coming and we'll use those next year and we'll upgrade them as well. The other thing is too, we're looking to better partner with NESU on opportunities. And so um, I know that uh, Heidi is currently working with Loretta Cruz and I fully expect that the first branch unified district middle schoolers will be joining in with our middle school spring sports, um, which I think is a good opportunity for us to partner. Where in the past, first branch has sometimes gone to Randolph and or Thefford Academy. Um, and so we're looking to strengthen that partnership within the SU walls. So um, I've been in conversation with them a few times now around that. Maybe theater and music too, just to think about bringing those kids in. You know, I got your back, Owen, on the, <laughs> the theater and music piece. <laughs> More suits. Yeah. yeah, I was a drum major in high school, if anyone wanted to know. So. <laughs> I, I was a thespian. I think you took my place, Jamie, actually. As the uh, you know, Shannon, now you say that, I think I may not. <laughs> Tammy, I did fix that link, so you should be able to get into it. I'm sorry. Thank you. I'm just trying to make sure the general public has able is able to navigate without issue. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, so um, I guess future agenda items, we have the food service again on there. Um, is there anything else? I guess the next board member appointing is gonna be a future agenda item. Um, yeah, and I've got the Lisa, uh, the regeneration core, and I got down the finance committee. Okay, is there anything else? Okay, so our next meeting date is Tuesday, April 20th at 6 p.m. And I think we're done. Entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Congratulations, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs>